There was something about the magic of living on this planet. Genius guitarist in the band Radiohead since the age of 16, Ed O'Brien has now released his first solo album, Earth. Speaking openly, he tells us about his long musical journey from successes to self-doubts and finding, finally, his own voice. Now from singer, Ed O'Brien frees himself and shines, offering a record full of optimism, a unique and inspiring journey. Tonight, generations and musical styles mix up, and together for an hour, we delve into the unique mindset of those major artists and find out what makes them so unique and so important in the current musical landscape. You're watching Echoes with Jenny Beth tonight in the company of Black Country New Road, Ed O'Brien and Kim Gordon. When I think of your performance, when I just saw it tonight, is you turn it, it's not just a live performance, you turn it into art. It's, a, it's an art performance for me. Um, and the fact that you just come here and film makes me just it's just who you are. I love this. It's part of your DNA. <laughs> I don't know. I just, um, you know, I went to a s elementary school that was all learned by doing. So um, I kind of, that's how I process stuff. And Is that how you deal with every day? Kind of. I mean, I'm not a very creative, everyday person, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, some people are really, everything they do is like, uh, you know, like the salad or whatever. It's not, you know, like. <laughs> I'm not one of those people. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, uh, I put tiring. my focus on things that I call art, you know, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's a time for art and a time for salad. Yeah, but you yeah. never know yeah. uh, where there's, you know, going to be a good idea, so. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to miss the good idea. Exactly. How do you catch a good idea? <laughs> I, I use my phone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Literally. Well, I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, literally, it's I mean, it, I, I, I found, and I learned very, I've learned very late that a good idea that actually needs to be caught. I used to think like, I used to always think mm. John, John Lennon, Paul McCartney always used to say, if it didn't stick in there, it wasn't. So I used to follow that train right, of thought. Right, exactly. But yeah. then I had nothing. I didn't have anything as good as <laughs> please, please me or yesterday, <laughs> right? <laughs> did you go to art college? Did we art school? I did in a fashion, yeah. yeah. Eventually I made it through like a patchwork of cheap education. <laughs> yeah, and Tyler, you're at art college, aren't you? Yeah. And it's like, I, Tom was at art college in our band, and he, he taught us, like... Do the, you think there's a particular mindset? Well, the ground rules you... of creativity, right? Mm. Like, the, keep, he said the most important thing he was taught was keeping a notebook. Yeah, Would definitely. Would that be...? Definitely. Uh, people always said that, but I don't do that. You don't? <laughs> I mean, I, I have so many notebooks that have, like, two lines yeah. in them. <laughs> Just, like, a stack of those things. Yes. With, some doodles and a yeah. couple lines. And then I'll get a new one because it's got yeah. a nice cover, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like the notebook's changing, like it's not just like a, a, a book that you write in anymore, it's like photography on yeah. your phone, it's like voice memos on your phone. Yeah. It's like, it's much more broad than just a book that you write in there. It's interesting with bringing you all together today is that um, you're all kind of on starting a new journey in a, in, a, in a very different way. I'm going to start with you, Black Country New Road, because I think your name is even a metaphor for rebirth. Yeah, yeah. Qu yeah quite accidentally. Accidentally? Yeah, I think I, I found it somewhere and I pitched it. And um, Where did you find it? Uh, Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> 2020. There's a, there's a button in the top left that sort of generates a random article. You said to me earlier backstage that it was sort of a, let's say, a metaphor for uh, leaving a bad place and starting something new. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I didn't see that when I first saw it, but I pitched it to the rest of the group, and uh, apparently that was very obvious from the beginning, but I didn't see it for about, it took me about a year. <laughs> and then someone pointed it out to me, and I had I've never realised. So is music a way to escape a certain bad place? For you? Uh, if, if, or writing? If, if music's all you can do, then yeah, probably. probably. <laughs> Is music all you can do? Uh, so far. <laughs> How 
how do you guys write? How do you, how, as a band, how do you, how, how does it go about? Well, someone like Isaac will, we will come up with an idea and then put it towards the group. Yeah. And we'll take it to a practice and play it out. Often a skeleton, the shape of the song is all there, like structured, which is quite different to the previous project that we were part of, which was mostly improv. Right. Mm, kind of influenced by like our interest in pop music. We all like that's our like the seven members of us in the band, and the one taste that we share is our love of pop music. So and, what like, kind of pop? What are we talking? Charlie XCX. Yeah, great. Um, Carly Rae Jepsen. Yeah. Ariana Grande. I have to say, I was uh, very impressed by your lyrics writing. It, it references culture, cultural elements all the time, and you mix high and low culture, and it's very conscious of itself. Um, what, what's your process with writing lyrics? I just, I just sort of write, write mostly in my phone. It will be you know, over, over a certain period of time, just making small notes, and then every now and then sitting down and committing you know, a few hours to actually looking at it properly. So if it's on your phone, is, do you do it when you're traveling? Definitely, definitely sort of cut up technique. Uh, lots of stuff is very small chunks, normally glued yeah. together, sort of process uh, how they might be connected later on. But it sounds like it's characters talking. Yeah, quite a lot of the time. One, one thing I've quite, always been quite interested in is sort of defense mechanisms that sort of kick in when you've, I don't know, when you've done something wrong, you've been a dick or something, and inner, inner voices saying, Making up excuses or trying to push, trying to push things to the side. I find that I always find that quite interesting. The initial backlash, sort of like, nah, it's fine. <laughs> I like that. So why did leave Kanye out of it? Come, where does that come from? That line. I really like, I really like Kanye West, and he can be difficult, and go, he goes through lots of weird ups and downs, but it, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's very natural, and he's very honest about it, which makes it enjoyable. Mm. And, I think makes it important. It, what's great, I think, now is that, like, you can reference, you're quite open about referencing pop music. We were so ghettoized in our music tastes growing up. Like, we couldn't... <laughs> have, no, we weren't. We, you know, we were very, like, mm, you know, 19, right. 1988, it was, like, the Smiths, Sonic Youth, the Pixies. Mm. And if you admitted, like, you know, a song from your childhood that was pure pop, even an ABBA song, which you grew up when you were age five. It was shame. Shame. Musicians give streaming a really hard time, or some musicians do. But one of the great things is how, for instance, you guys can hear any kind of music. Yeah. For us growing up, we'd have to buy it or we'd have to tape it. Right, well, now uh, there's also no context for anything. So exactly. you're just listening yeah. to sounds. Yeah. And, I mean, it's like plus and minus. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it's kind of like everything is everything. Yeah. Everything is nothing. <laughs> yeah. But why the context was important in the past? Because, well, it was important because the music kind of came out of communities, you know, small local communities. It's just different music making. Not, one is not right or wrong. It's just one is more um, yeah. based on, um, I guess, a kind of tradition of rock in a way, even though it's not rock music. Yeah. I think for us it was more of a, more about sort of looking back at what we'd done before and uh, the pop thing becomes uh, a desire to make things uh, succinct and impactful and, yeah. and if you know a moment is supposed to be climactic then you have to know when it's coming so that it can build to that moment correctly and that played a big part in the, in the, in the, in the transition and the development of our sound, I think. How do you feel on stage? I mean, I don't mind things being awkward, and I kind of like that a little bit. Um, sometimes that's almost hard to achieve in a way to be at ease with that sort of awkwardness. So it feels kind of real in a, in a certain way. But um, there's a certain level of, of professionalism that I feel like gets in the way of actually the music. Right. And so it's kind of a battle between, a balance between the two things. Mm. It's weird because that doesn't come across at all in your performance. I didn't get that tonight at all. Yeah. But maybe tonight was a good night. <laughs> <laughs>
everything. It became like yeah. the most important thing in my life. It became like my backbone. Didn't matter what happened, you know, my parents just split up, all this. Didn't matter whether that or, or a girl dumped me or anything, I had the band. And it was, it was that important. Kim and Sonic Youth were like a huge, huge infant. So we we're trying to be as, we weren't nearly as cool, but we were trying to be as cool. Did you see Sonic Youth in, back I in the day? I saw Sonic Youth in 92. Yeah, wow. at Brixton Academy with Pavement. And it was, it was kind of religious. The, the sound that you got was so powerful so powerful so age 21 we probably bought distortion pedals in homage <laughs> you know right. and the three of us well, rather Kim, than one person Kim has we, done a really great use of distortion tonight yeah exactly <laughs> the master class in the master class exactly <laughs> yeah, i learned how to use a distortion box so <laughs> if nothing else <laughs> yeah and how do you feel about what ed is saying about a band is everything becomes your backbone i mean i'm currently at art school and right. I'm meant to be graduating soon, but you know it's, it's really, really difficult. And there's like all of us are at university right now. Okay. But I kind of feel like I would sacrifice anything in my life to just make sure that everything goes well for the band. Mm. Like, I will graduate, but it will be a struggle. But I don't care about the struggle because <laughs> this band is everything to us. We're we're a family, you know. Yeah, I think it, yeah we've been playing together in one form or another for maybe close to five years, which yeah. probably wow. doesn't sound like. And how many shows have you played so far? Couldn't count them. <laughs> it's been so many. Together, maybe a hundred. Yeah, I would say. But well, that's wow. more than the three of us together yeah. <laughs> in, in our new we project. We haven't even got it on one hand, right? <laughs> <laughs> or two hands. We were joking backstage. This is Kim's third show, is it? And this is your sixth Six, show. Sixth. Yeah. Yeah. Were you a lyricist before? Were you a writer before you started? Not really. I think I'd written one song after the last band broke up, and that was my first song. I was trying to sort of fill the gap the void that the uh, previous group had created. Mm. Uh, Did then... you feel like a certain um, discomfort or...? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, 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 uh, well, didn't, I don't think it, it didn't come particularly naturally, me, naturally to me at the beginning. And I don't know if it, it does come particularly naturally to me at this point, but it's, Yeah, uh... yeah. That excitement and discomfort at the same time when you're starting something new and you're not really sure you're ready to do something like that, and I feel that's something similar with some of the conversations we've yeah. had about you being um, a guitarist yeah. uh, in, in Radiohead and then suddenly coming in the front. For me, it wasn't even like I tried to start writing. It was this really weird, almost like, like a eureka moment or something. Something happens and I, f I felt completely pulled and, you know, I've been so thankful I'm part of this band, but for me there was always kind of like a hole and I didn't know what it was. I thought it's just me being pathetic or something, <laughs> you know. I'm in this band that I love and I'm with my brothers and we're making this music that I'm re I really love. And then our third album, OK Computer, so proud of it. We love it and, you know, it gets a lot of recognition. And I was so depressed and, and I've heard this from so many people like you, because you <laughs> think, this will solve that hole, that problem. And it's not, and you realize you have to go inwards. So I felt like I wanted to make a really warm, loving record. And my journey has been like, like that and sort of coming out and, and feeling the sunshine. So I wanted to put that into the music. I grew up in Oxford. And Oxford is, it's, it's a very nice place to grow up. You guys, Cambridge, right? Yeah. But it's very zipped up in terms of, <laughs> it's not emotional. You know, it's very cerebral. So I had this very, very kind of cerebral upbringing, which I'm very thankful of because mm. it was no nonsense. It was, but then you go to a country like Brazil and South America and it's big heart. And there's, and I love the writing of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who's Colombian, obviously, in the whole yeah. magical realism. I think Brazil for us was really important as an emotional place and that's where the warmth came from. But also your record's called Earth. Yeah. And in your, in your song yeah. Brazil, yeah. You, you show us the Earth from, yeah. seen from the universe, which I always think is a very moving image. I can't really look at the Earth without feeling emotional. Well, yeah, totally. That, because that's a change of perspective. And yeah. the Carl Sagan, you know... Pale Blue Dot. Uh, Pale Blue Dot text, which, which you cite as a reference. This image that was taken of the Earth by Voyager 1 spacecraft. And it's the furthest distant, it's this photo taken of it, and there's this tiny blue dot and this arrow. 
And Carl Sagan, the cosmologist, wrote these incredible words. Basically, this is our home, this is us. You know, every war that's ever been fought, ever, every love, lover that's ever, it's basically the big, the big perspective. And I found it so inspiring. And astronauts, when they go out into space, they have this thing, and they call it the overview effect, where they look down on the Earth, and it's like this blue jewel. It's so incredible, and they have this incredible connection. It's a spiritual connection. And I also was feeling that in Brazil. There was something about the magic of living on this planet that sometimes for me gets lo definitely gets lost we live, living we in London. We forget it. I think yeah. we spend a lifetime forgetting that we're mortal yeah. and uh, forgetting that we live on a planet as well. Yeah. It's depressing to think about the planet, actually. What do you mean is depressing? It's, you know, climate change is yeah. Yeah. depressing. Yeah. <laughs> you the, you know, the fact that our cap capitalist economy is set up towards consumerism, which is basically against changing the way we live and to overcome what's happened with the planet. Uh, when you were 21, Kim and Ed, uh, was musical you could do? I mean, I didn't play music. <laughs> At 21? No, I was, um, I guess, trying to figure out how to make art and learning, yeah, about, you wanted learning to be, about conceptual art. and You wanted to visual art mostly, yeah, right? I didn't ever want to be a musician. I just kind of fell into it. You didn't play music? You liked music? or was oh, Yeah, I liked music a lot. Right. I mean, I grew up listening to um, my parents listen to a lot of jazz yeah. and, um, you know, Bill Holiday and um, mm. then I don't know, all the brothers had listened to a lot of like 60s music and Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell and um, Neil Young and things like that. And then when I moved to New York, I um, saw these kind of no way bands. It wasn't as conventional as punk rock. So like DNA or Glenn Branca? Yeah, exactly, yeah. DNA. It was kind of more expressionistic and a lot of those people were artists who had moved to New York and then start playing music. Yeah. So it was that was kind of like, oh, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I made this record if I wasn't living in LA, and it was just um, right. coincidental that um, this guy, Justin Raisin, was very persistent. I kind of accidentally met his brother. Your producer? And, yeah. Oh, did he reach out to you first? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had no intention of making a record. And he wanted me to sing on someone else's record, and he kept sending me stuff, and I eventually went in. And, and then it wasn't until really like a year and a half later that I ended up going back. And I was just like, oh, I'm kind of bored, and I don't have any art projects. <laughs> I was just like, maybe, I, I don't know, just like recording stuff in my iPhone and started sending it to them. And yeah. I don't like the word solo record, but because it's your record, suddenly it's not a band relationship, but it's right. you and the producer, right. which is very modern in a way. Yeah, that it's something that I was always kind of um, skeptical of, making records oh, that right. way, because it wasn't this organic way of making records or the, because you know, the way Sonic Youth worked, or even me and Bill, this experimental duo I had with called Body yeah. Head. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and I always thought of it as more of an LA kind of way of working and songwriting. It surprises me that you think that it's not, it didn't feel um, natural at first because you've been very um, open at saying you like you, you like hip hop culture, mm -hmm. which is very beat driven, and with a producer who takes a lot of space, and then there's an MC who comes in, which is kind of how you've dealt yeah, with this. Yeah, I, mean, I think I had to kind of change my head around about it in that way, and I did. Okay. Like. I was never going to make a hip hop record, but I liked that idea of it's starting very... with the rhythm and building it up. Whether it was like, um, yeah. like a Stooges kind of rhythm or like a no wave rhythm or something. Or, yeah, yeah or it's very bass beat. driven. And I, I love that yeah. about your record. Who's the Hungry Baby? Hungry Baby, it's, you know, it's some dude <laughs> or many dudes. You know, it's kind of a Me Too situation. Oh, is it? I mean, I wrote a song in 1990 about sexual harassment called swimsuit issue yeah. and 30 years later it's, you know i mean that you know nothing really changed during that right. time it's just kind of um it's it's a symptom of the culture in some way and it's the most angry song you've played i guess tonight. yeah <laughs> yeah it's 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 kind of inspired though by actually the, the, the stooges really mm. yeah well on that very beautiful note Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the shows. Thank you, everyone.